Yes, Flipendo comes back with a vengeance. The Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets movie was released just a year after the first one in 2002. Naturally, there had to be game adaptations launched alongside the film, and Electronic Arts has followed exactly the same strategy as before. Get as many teams working on as many versions for as many platforms to catch as big an audience as possible. So, like with Philosopher's Stone, there are also five absolutely different game adaptations of Chamber of Secrets. And right now we're discussing the PC version created by No Wonder. This retelling of the story where Harry, Hermione and Ron investigate the attacks on Muggleborn children while uncovering the mystery behind the Chamber of Secrets is a direct continuation of the Philosopher's Stone PC version, based on the same engine and mechanics. And I will say from the get-go, it is a massive improvement of everything that we have seen in the first game. I do mean everything. Starting with basic controls that are much more comfortable. The camera doesn't shake erratically while you try to look around. When you cast a spell, the character and camera no longer stay in place. You target with the center of your camera view and retain your full movement, which makes spell casting so much more pleasant. You know, though you still can rotate the camera separately from the character, now Harry can actually strafe, so it's not a problem. The only little issue with the camera that still remains from the first game is you not being able to look up and down while moving, but it's not that frustrating. The first game had this weird thing when Harry couldn't climb any ledge he gets to while midair unless he falls down far enough to grab it with his hands. Here Harry easily gets onto any ledge midair. Also, the animations are much faster and not as annoying. Just in general, Chamber of Secrets is a great example of how time and iteration can achieve a significant increase in quality, which can't be understated. And it definitely helps that besides improving the actual core mechanics, everything built around them is also better. The structure of the game has seen some changes. On a broad level, Chamber of Secrets switches up between one-time plot-related missions where you're dealing with the main mystery behind the chamber and spell challenges, this time replayable, where you add new spells to the arsenal. And in between those levels you can freely roam and explore Hogwarts as a hub world, with more secrets becoming available to you as you learn new spells. Quidditch, outside of the first mandatory practice, is relegated to an extracurricular activity you're free to do when you want, alongside the new dueling club side activity. While Philosopher's Stone did have the thematic wrapper of lessons and whatnot, it didn't really incorporate the school theme in its overall design. But here the pacing of switching up between lessons and solving a mystery while doing other school-related activities inherently feels like Harry Potter. It also helps that the house cup points you get for your performance in different levels and side activities are not totally useless this time. The main problem still remains, they don't matter for the ending. Even if you're behind Slytherin in the house cup, you'll still get the same cutscene where they barely avoid disqualification for some reason and Gryffindor wins. And now for the second place house. It'll be you, Gryffindors. You're naturally second best. You won't steal the house cup from Slytherin like you did last year. After barely escaping disqualification, Slytherin... What? That means... First place, and the house cup goes to Gryffindor. Yes! We did it again! But still, there is some sense of competition involved, because after every challenge lesson you will get a house cup ceremony, and whoever is in the lead at that time will enter the bonus bean room. So it just might be that your rival Draco will be rewarded instead of you. And that's a nice touch. How many times have you been in, Potter? Better luck next time. Beans have more uses this time around than in the first game, being an actual currency. Fred and George have managed to set up a whole bean-based economy system. You will be able to buy ingredients for potions, not that you're gonna need them a lot, Chamber of Secrets is not a game where you'll get much damage. Also, you can buy optional upgrades for your Quidditch gear, entrance bit to the Duel and Club competition, but most importantly, you can use beans to buy wizard cards. 
And this is important, because wizard cards that appear in the shop are those that you have missed in one of the linear levels, some of which become permanently unavailable once you beat them. It's a sorely needed quality of life improvement. If you've missed a secret during your playthrough, you're no longer blocked from completing your card collection, which by the way is four times bigger than in the original title, with 101 wizard cards to find. You don't really get anything for collecting everything except a bonus challenge room and a sense of personal satisfaction, but it is an enjoyable activity in and of itself. Not the least because the levels and the secrets within them are much better designed. But all the speaking, the level design principles in Chamber of Secrets are the same as in Philosopher's Stone. Each is essentially a linear pathway with different optional secrets protruding out of it. It should be noted that Harry retains almost all spells from the first game. The exceptions are Wingardium Leviosa, the Levitation spell, and Incendio, the Fire spell, the latter of which essentially has been replaced by Defindo, the cutting spell used mostly for the same purposes. Having this base array of spells has allowed the sequel to have more interesting levels from the get-go, as you're not limited to only jumping. So main paths regularly tease the goal you need to reach, have you move through locations from different angles, and vary the challenges they present, but the biggest engagement in levels comes from discovering secrets. A lot of them are based on noticing things. For example, you can see an optional challenge star, but don't know how to get to it. Well, if you start completing your main goal of pushing fire crabs onto a platform, which will help you reach the goal at the top of the level, you might notice that said platform at the bottom opens up a secret door as it is pushed down. Some secrets require you to think before casting a spell, like if you cut too many ropes, you will not be able to reach a certain location. There are even little puzzles that have a single solution for the main path, but also alternative solutions to uncover secret areas. The game is really creative in circumventing one of the biggest flaws of the original that still stays in this game. The fact that each object gets a spell assigned to it, and all you really have to do, as long as you know the spell, is to point at the object and click the mouse. That is really limiting. There are some exceptions, like fire crabs, on which you have to first use Rictus Sempra to stun them, and then Flipendo to push them where you need to. But in practice, that's still just you targeting them several times in a row. Interestingly enough, in the Duel and Club minigame you can actually choose between three different spells. Offensive Rictus Sempra, Defensive Expelliarmus, and a stunning Mimble Wimble. But because Expelliarmus deflects the spell back at the caster rather than blocks it, the minigame transforms into a tennis match with Mimble Wimble being essentially useless. There are other seemingly useless elements, like the timer in spell challenge levels. You go in, are told you have a limited amount of time, and then you see that this time is a whooping 2500 seconds. That's 40 minutes, which are replenished as you collect challenge stars. And while I know this game is supposed to be played by children as well, like I've told you in the Philosopher's Stone review, they shouldn't be underestimated. Sometimes the game doesn't even bother to wait before providing a solution. For example, before the battle with Aragog even starts, Harry already says in a cutscene he should cut the spider webs down. The boss battles themselves are more interesting than those in Philosopher's Stone, again an improvement, but at the same time their design is pretty basic, requiring a single strategy in any given fight stage. But this fear to add a little bit of challenge is best shown in the relationship between our health, potions and the damage we receive. I'm not even talking about making the player fail a lot, that's not necessary but just something that would vary the dynamics of the game. Chamber of Secrets introduces brewing of health potions that you can do in any cauldron as long as you have the required ingredients, which aren't that difficult to come by. You can also upgrade your maximum health when you find enough bronze wizard cards. You'd think that these aspects would provide enough leeway to add something with higher chances of hitting or otherwise damaging you. But no, so as a result the game just keeps getting easier as you progress, since the difficulty curve largely stays on the same level throughout the whole experience, while you're getting your health upgraded many times over. At the same time, being easy is better than being annoying, especially in segments that aren't focused on core gameplay. There is a single little stealth section in Chamber of Secrets, with the level itself really not designed for stealth at all. But because you fail not when you get detected, but when somebody actually catches you, you can just run towards your goal and nothing bad will happen. 
The Maroon Stick in the optional Quidditch games is now on rails. So while you don't have full 360 degree control of how you fly, you have a better sense of speed, it is much more comfortable to play, and the game can provide more interesting situations with a path that sets for you as you need to avoid bludgers and compete with other seekers while following the snitch. It can, but it doesn't. Out of 6 Quidditch games, 5 play essentially the same with a little bit of a difference in difficulty and only the last one has a more interesting progression, with the race towards the snitch going below the field, which is actually a very cool moment. Still, what I'm really doing now is basically lamenting how things could have been even better, but Chamber of Secrets is still a really enjoyable game to play as it is. In terms of story too. Chamber of Secrets is not devoid of some quirks one might find weird without knowing the source material, but as a whole, this time the narrative is built in a much more well-structured manner. Characters, concepts and plot threads are actually set up and have progression. For example, the message about the Chamber of Secrets doesn't just appear on the wall. Harry hears whispers before that, so there's foreshadowing. What was that? What was what? That voice! It was coming from over there! Come on! And Mrs. Norris isn't the victim that appears out of nowhere. There is a situation beforehand that introduces her as Filch's cat. Argus Filch, the caretaker, was loathed by every student at Hogwarts. Some thought his cat, Mrs. Norris, spied on students. The main trio doesn't suspect Malfoy is the heir of Slytherin just because. The game firsthand shows his distaste for those born from non-magical parents, so we know why that theory would make sense for them. No one asks your opinion, you filthy little mudblood. You pay for that one, Malfoy! Likewise, the dueling club scene where Harry learns he can talk to snakes, which is what Salazar Slytherin was known for, happens after the scene where a teacher explains the legend behind the chamber. And this naturally leads Harry to wonder if he was sorted in the wrong house or not. You've been wondering whether I put you in the right house. Yes, you were particularly difficult to place, but I stand by what I said before. You would have done well in Slytherin. Oh my gosh! Now, you might be listening to this and thinking that I'm just describing the obvious, that of course this is how stories should work. But here's the thing, it didn't in the Philosopher's Stone game, everything was all over the place there. Chamber of Secrets actually has a proper structure. Sadly, there are still plenty of hiccups, none of which are too egregious to the point of things stopping to make sense, but they still affect the quality of the narrative. For example, Dobby is seen only in the beginning cutscene and then is never heard of again. Ron tells Harry that they've missed the train to Hogwarts Express just minutes after Ron's family and literally every other Hogwarts student were in the same bookstore as Harry. Ron's wand is never broken, which is not mandatory for the plot, of course, but there is a scene where Lockhart tries to cast a spell at the children with Ron's wand and it backfires at him, so it's not clear why that happens. Or Hagrid giving a hint to follow the spiders without actually knowing that there's anybody there. Harry and Ron never talk to him. You get a better sense of friendship between Harry, Ron and Hermione than in the first game because they have more active roles in the story and interact more, but the themes of the source material are sorely missing. While Harry wonders if he was sorted into the right house, the importance of personal choice is never digged into. And while the word mudblood is mentioned a couple of times, and Harry being a parcel mouth is quite shocking, the theme of accepting those who are different is also not present. A very important principle, by the way, you'd think more people in this world would follow it. Anyway, we've discussed pretty much all the ways how Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets has improved as an experience in comparison to the first title, which means it's time to rate it with the Stasocritic scoring system. Stasocritic is divided into 5 different categories of various weights, where every score from 0 to 10 has their own criteria. The first category is design, which has the biggest weight, 4, since the way a game is structured and built is what influences our experience the most. I will assign a 7. 
Chamber of Secrets literally took everything Philosopher's Stone has set up and made it better. Controls, levels, secrets, structure, it's a solid game. But it also is held back by the flaws still retained from the first part. Like the spellcasting system, which only poses limitations that level design has to find ways to go around of, the lack of depth in minigames, bosses that are better than in Philosopher's Stone but are still pretty basic. Still, the jump from 4 of Philosopher's Stone to 7 is definitely a big one. Let's get to emotions. This is the most subjective category of Stasso Critic, but it's the one with the second biggest weight, 3. It is all about personal feelings, but at the end of the day, your personal feelings matter a lot. I will assign a 9. There's not much to say really, I greatly enjoyed the game, in fact I've 100%ed it, got all the cards and finished all the activities. Are there flaws? Sure, but they're not enough to ruin enjoyment in any significant way. We move on to Cohesion, a category with a weight of 2 as it's about how well the game connects all of its different aspects together to create a wholesome experience. I will assign a 7. Chamber of Secrets, thanks to its structure that varies between lessons and investigation, extracurricular activities and an explorable world, does feel like a Harry Potter experience. But still there's enough sort of arbitrary elements that are in it, mostly because it's a game. For example, how in the context of the levels, Slytherin students every day have to go through a deadly obstacle range to get into their common room, and that kind of stuff prevents me from assigning a higher score. Now let's discuss context, which is about things that enhance the experience but don't necessarily define it. Plot, motivation, character arcs, etc. I will assign a 7. The plot is structured well, enjoyable to experience, and there are some nice character moments too, but also not only the game is missing character arcs and exploration of the source material's themes, but there's a bunch of weird little things spread around the whole narrative that make it somewhat inconsistent. Still solid. And finally, we have Aesthetics, a category about aspects that also enhance the experience rather than define it, through visual style, music, sounds, etc. I will assign an 8. Like pretty much everything else in the game, there have been big improvements since Philosopher's Stone in terms of graphical fidelity, animation quality, sound mixing, that's all undeniable. But sadly there are areas where the game doesn't go far enough. For example, characters can open their mouths now as opposed to talking with their lips shut, but mm, it still looks pretty weird and robotic, largely because they rarely move their arms or otherwise use their body language while talking. But now it's time to sum everything up. After all scores and their weights are taken into account, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets for PC gets a final Stasocritic rating of 76. It's a really good game. Now, if you haven't watched my other videos, I have to clarify that in the context of my system, 70 plus means that a game is solid, as it is increasingly difficult to get 80 plus and 90 plus especially. In fact, if you enjoy this type of action-adventure titles, I would recommend Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets even if you're not a Harry Potter fan. It's just a good game that you might really enjoy. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets is really a testament to the power of iteration in video games. Philosopher's Stone most likely had a very short development time, which is why a lot of things didn't really work out. But by taking that game as a foundation, the team at No Wonder essentially had an extra year to build upon what they have done before, and the results are great. I think it's a shame that Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets for the most part is a forgotten piece of video game history now. I know why it was forgotten. It's a movie tie-in, and this type of game is very rarely remembered globally. But Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, despite its flaws, is just a very good and enjoyable title. And I do hope that you found this review to also be good and enjoyable enough to leave a like as well as a comment below. Thank you all for watching. <laughs>